Uh, thank you all for joining us for the lunch and the lunch panel. So we're going to talk about school choice and accountability in practice. So when we think about accountability, we really think of accountability as a multidimensional issue. Uh, we have teachers who are accountable to principals, principals run schools that are accountable to school districts and the administration in general. And then today we also heard about social accountability where parents and communities hold the schools and the administration accountable. And so we're, in this panel, we're gonna sort of diverge away from social accountability and focus more on uh, the sort of system of accountability within the administration and the school level. And so for that, uh, we have three of our panelists are principals of charter schools. And one of the big aspects of today's conference is on innovation. And these charter schools have been innovating in very unique ways. And we l learn a little bit about how they're doing that respectively in their schools. And we also have Kara Armanzendia, uh, who is um, in the pub uh, St. Paul Public School District. So she's uh, the um, assistant director of research evaluation uh, and she also works a lot on accountability. And turning to the principals, uh, we have Colette Owens, who is executive director of Hiawatha Academies. We have Carrie uh, Bracken, is a pro program coordinator and teacher of Avalon School, and you'll know why we're not calling her a principal in a minute. And we have John, I'm gonna get this wrong, but uh, Gowanensky is the director of Math and a, a Science Academy. So I'll hand it over to uh, each of the panelists to introduce uh, their institutions more in detail and, and sort of talk about what makes it unique. So I'll start with Cara. Oh, great. Okay. Is this on? Yes, I think so. Okay, great. So first, a disclaimer. I have, um, I've been with St. Paul Public Schools only for a few months now. Uh, prior to that, I was at the Minnesota Department of Education. So if there are questions later, I will uh, try to answer them, but if not, I might get back to you, I guess. So I just wanted to, I'm still learning um, about the district and everything that it offers and does because it is a very, it's a large urban district for those of you who aren't uh, from Minnesota. It's, I think, the second or third largest district in the state. Um, and so there's a, a lot going on there, a lot of exciting things happening, actually. As far as our, the composition of St. Paul Public Schools, so we have about 80% of our students um, are students of color. Uh, our largest um, population is our Asian students, about 30%. And after that is a little bit under a third are black or African-American students. And we have about 20% of our students are white. 30% um, of our students are English language learners. Uh, so we have a large population of English language learners in, in St. Paul. And about almost 70% uh, are eligible for free and reduced price lunch. Um, and one of the questions uh, that Anusha had sent us was to talk about the innovation going on in the district. Mm -hmm. And this is the piece where I feel as though I'm still learning all of the amazing programs that are happening in St. Paul, uh, but, and how, and, and how we think about innovation. So for me, I think about it as a program or a site level, what's kind of happening that's different um, and, and creative for parents, especially as we think about school choice and how parents and families can pick different options. And St. Paul has a variety of options. We have everything from language immersion programs across uh, different languages. We have IB schools. There's Montessori models happening in St. Paul. We have science, uh, technology schools, also schools that really focus on the arts, creative arts programs. So I really feel like there's a lot going on uh, there's a lot of opportunities for choice for our parents and families, and um, for, for families that are interested in St. Paul Public Schools, um, there's, there's a lot of options and a lot of uh, good things going on. Uh, I'm John. I'm from uh, the Math and Science Academy in Woodbury. For those of you that aren't familiar with the metropolitan area here in Minnesota, Woodbury is on the eastern side of the suburbs, kind of on the outside of the first the 694, 494 ring. Uh, the area that uh, our students come from are predominantly from the traditional school district, 833, which is the Woodbury School District. It includes Cottage Grove and uh, three, high, three major high schools. Uh, our school, our high school, is really a lot smaller than uh, St. Paul. <laughs> 
Uh, we have a 6th through 12th uh, program, and our total population is 529. Uh, it's split almost half, 6th through 8th, and then 9th through 12th. There's a difference of one student between the two different uh, middle school, what we call middle school and the high school. Uh, our focus is math and science. Uh, all of our students have to pass calculus in order to graduate. And then they also have to pass physics, chemistry, biology, and three years of Spanish, or else they don't get the diploma, along with all the other state uh, graduation requirements. Our demographics, when we first started in 1999, we were almost predominantly 100% uh, Caucasian white, and that caused, you know, we were very, very homogenous. And now, this past uh, year, we've gone, a, a slow transformation. Uh, in nineteen or in twenty seventeen, we had fifty eight percent white. It was twenty percent Asian, twelve percent uh, black and African American, and about seven percent dual race. This year's sixth grade class is about one third, one third, one third. So we're seeing a major switch in our demographics. Our test scores, though, have not taken any kind of a dip. In fact, uh, the last two years, uh, we have led the state in the ACT, the uh, composite AT, ACT score. So we have not seen a drop at all in our test scores, even though we've experienced a fairly large change in demographics. A couple of things that are unique to our school, though, we have a very low EL population. It's only 1%. Um, the vast majority of our students will come from a lottery because we have a waiting list of over 450 students. A lot of those students, though, are coming in or entering the lottery from your professional uh, parents. Uh, we have a lot of our students that come from, uh, have parents at 3M or, or uh, uh, lawyers and doctors. So we don't pull a lot of the lower social economic uh, students just because we don't have a free lunch. We have no lunch facility on our campus. So everybody brown bags it or brings in whatever. So that's a major change or major shift for me to understand coming from a traditional school district and then uh, I served at another charter school before I came to this school and it was a major uh, eye-opener for me. I didn't know that schools even existed that did that. <laughs> well, we do. Um, and our waiting list is so long, it's just grown every year that we are to the point now where we're looking at doing a replication. So I really appreciated that information on replication because that's one thing we're looking at doing is doing a major replication where uh, that hasn't been determined. Uh, the other thing I guess I would uh, for those of you that aren't aware of it, charter schools in Minnesota have to have three different populations on their school board. They have to have teachers, they have to have parents, and a community member. Our uh, school board is consisted of four teachers, three parents, and then two community members. The other thing that's kind of unique about our situation with our school board is either the chair or the vice chair has to be a teacher. So the teacher empowerment, they have a direct say in how the school is run. And that is probably one of the biggest changes I've seen from the uh, charter school I went, uh, I taught at 10 years until this year. Uh, the biggest change or shift is how much the teachers are involved at, at MSA. The other school I was at before uh, was very, very top-down driven, I would say much more. Um, and I taught at a traditional school district, much more a traditional, nothing against traditional school districts, but a lot more top down. It wasn't as much pushed from the bottom up. And uh, at our school, uh, we have all kinds of committees. It takes a lot longer to get you know work done because we have a ton of meetings, but the buy-in is there and our turnover for staff is very, very low.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Colette Owens, and I'm the executive director at Hiawatha Academies. Uh, similar to Kara, I'm, I'm very new in my role. I've only been in Minneapolis for about three months now, um, brand new to Minnesota. And so Hiawatha Academies is a charter network in South Minneapolis. There, uh, we are five campuses, two elementary, uh, middle, which is 5-8, a brand new middle school we opened this year that's just fifth grade, but will grow out to eighth grade, and then a high school that's nine through 12. Um, and this is our first year of being a complete K-8 network. We have our first class of seniors this year that will graduate. Um, Hiawatha Academies is founded on the sort of core belief that we empower all of our students with knowledge, character, and leadership skills to graduate college and serve the common good. Um, our student demographics are about 85% Latinx, uh, about 10% African American or African, and then the other sort of 5% um, Asian, white, multiracial students. Um, we serve per, a pretty significant portion of students who are free and reduced lunch, somewhere between 85 and 93% given the year, I mean, given the information that we get from parents. Um, and then we also do serve a significant English language, pop, English language learner population. Um, we, I think, uh, some of what we think are our approaches and the work that we do is really specifically centered on two main things. The sort of learning-centered environment we create for kids that's high expectations that really is about the college-ready bar. Um, and the reason why holding that expectation is so important, particularly for students of color and students from low-income backgrounds where there have been systemic barriers in terms of access and success at the college level. Um, in addition to that sort of high expectations, we have a key belief in and focus around equity and actually believe in sort of equity work and development as a key part of our staff development, our students' experience, and for our parents as well. Um, and then work really closely with our families and our parents as partners. So to some of the earlier conversation, run Family Academy, really working to empower and engage parents as partners in the work um, and bringing them to have a, as a seat at the table. I'm Carrie Bach, and I'm from Avalon School, and we are a school that serves grades 6 through 12, and we're about 240 students, so maybe the small school represented here. Um, we have been open, this is our 18th year, we've been doing project-based learning, and it's had teacher ownership and still has teacher ownership since it's opened, and so that's why I have worked there um, 18 years. I do a lot of administrative work, but I am one of the program coordinators who does administrative work, but I also am still with students, so it's really fulfilling that way. Um, Avalon serves, um, a, it's primarily um, student, white students, so about 70%, that fluctuates year to year, about 10 to 15% African American, 10 to 15% um, Asian American, and then 5% um, students who identify as multiracial or our American Indian population is also growing right now and I think we need to do a lot more work around that to better support our community. Um, we also sub have a very high special ed population. So it's about 40%. And then on top of that, uh, students who have 504, so another area for support for students with disabilities, is so it would be over 50% of our students have diagnosed disabilities. Um, our model, because it is multi-age advisories, because it's project-based, really serves kids with disabilities very well. It serves all students well, but it, it um, is very um, interesting to parents who have had kids pulled out of um, their community because they need special ed services, and, and they can be integrated, and it's, um, it's much more team-based, so it's, it works really well. Um, so we are in a lottery situation as well. We do go into a lottery every March. Right now, I don't know what our waiting list is. That fluctuates as well. It's not 400. <laughs> but, um, but that has shifted our demographics a little bit too, and I, I wish there was room for everybody right away in March. But usually in, at Avalon, you are able to get in um, by the end of the summer. So usually there's enough fluctuation um, on the waiting list that people can get into Avalon. But it's not immediate, and I think that would be better if we could have somebody who is not doing so well in a school be able to pop into Avalon. Um, so that's one of, you know, something that working on is getting more room. Um, but what, is, what works really well, and when you walk into Avalon, what you see won't be a traditional school. 
what you will see is students have their own individual workspace. They're in multi-age advisories, grades 9 through 12. So we get to know families really well. Um, I have my own children in Minneapolis Public Schools. And recently, I stopped going to conferences. <laughs> like, I'm just a disengaged parent because I show up at conferences, and it's five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. And I have to run around the Edison and try to find the building. And then they just show me what's in the parent portal, which my son has already told me about anyway. And it's, so I don't really get that continuity. I have to I have that relationship through him. And I get to know how he's doing through that. But I, I don't get that half hour where you, you, know, you get to talk about holistically, how is my kid doing? Tell me about how this is working. You know, I get to see the parent portal. So I think we really engage parents that way. So they get to have a holistic view of how their child is doing. And we have that relationship with them for four years and for three years in the middle school. So really, I think the other key piece of Avalon is that students have a huge say in their education. They decide if they want to meet the standard through a class or if they want to do a project. So they really own the entire process. And then we get to capitalize on those interests, and I get to see the coolest projects ever. So, um, so I won't say more, but it's worth visiting. It doesn't look like a traditional school at all. Okay, thanks for all the detailed uh, uh, information about your school, which is very useful to sort of try and assess uh, some of the issues that we'll be talking about. And first of the issues, this first issue that we would like to talk about is um, teacher accountability. So we saw today that teachers matter a lot. There's also a lot of research which sort of quantifies teacher value added and shows that it's uh, very important. Some of the work that Raj Chetty and his co-authors have done have sort of given numbers as big as sort of if you, you know, change the bottom 5% of the teacher from and, and replace them with an average teacher that increases composite earnings of per child by a magnitude of about $50,000. So that's not trivial, but it seems like teachers do have a big effect. So I'd, start, I'd like to start with Carrie. She didn't really go into details about uh, the system uh, in, in her school, but it's a teacher-led school. There's no principal. Teachers collectively decide and make decisions. So I would like you to sort of elaborate a little bit more about how the incentive system works in your school. Yeah, so we actually run the school collectively, and we did grow and grow, and then we did hit our breaking point. So we always had asked that question over the years, like, how do you, how do, you do this collectively? How do you do this collectively? And we, we had had everybody at the table, everybody who worked in the school at the table, and we had to renegotiate how we made decisions. So, right, so instead of the office manager, the... Um, you know, every educational assistant, even if they only work there a month, participating in decision making, it, it got too cumbersome. So we really want everybody's input. We know that an educational assistant, even if you've worked there for three days, that you're an important part of this kid's life, and we need to include your input and we, you know, encourage your um, support. But we needed to like make it more efficient. So last year we we changed it back to teacher ownership. So really the teachers are making the decisions. We have a space in our staff meetings for input, but then the teachers take it back and, and make that decision. So it's still 24 people making all the decisions. <laughs> so, um, so navigating that, um, it sounds really inefficient, but we've do done a lot of meeting training. We have a strong agenda. We have a process for voting. Uh, we do a lot of committee work. Um, so by the time a decision's made, there's been a lot of pre-work that's been done, and it, it isn't as inefficient as you would imagine. I think what it does support is a tremendous amount of buy-in. So then when you vote for a decision, um, I have to own that as well. So I don't, I don't go, well, I don't know why this rule's the way it is, but you have to do it anyway. I, I can fully embrace why that rule is the way it is. And if we need to change it, if it's not working well, we have the autonomy as well. And I think, I think when our biggest thing that we're teaching is not to make this crazy, wonderful place for teachers. It is to model agency. So... So a kid knows that when he talks to me or she talks to me that I have some power in the organization and I can support and help the student get um, develop agency, they see that they, they have agency as well. So we're modeling agency, we're modeling collaboration, we're modeling an effective relationships, 
And I think that's where the true power comes from. So just a general question for the three principles is, when you're deciding uh, when we have to hire someone, what do you look in a teacher? How do you define an effective teacher? Well, uh, I guess I'll jump in. <laughs> um, when we, in our hiring process, I always include the department of whatever department that student, that, that teacher's going into. And I'm looking for how does that teacher fit in with that group? Because the teachers in the department are doing, they're doing the segregating. They, they're asking all those questions. And I'm just, I'm back there checking to see how are those, is that candidate going to fit with these, these other adults in the room and get along? Are they going to play nice or not? Is it going to be a good match? Um, case in point, this past summer I had three very experienced teachers at the very last hour, pretty much, got uh, offers and that we kind of knew were coming, but you, know, you can't post the position until you get that letter of resignation. And it was getting right up to school, you know, the start of school. And do you hire somebody to fill up, to plug a hole or not? And my attitude is, I'm going to go empty. I will, I will leave that hole there until I find the right person. And they always seem to show up somehow. And they, and and we ended up with a math, and a math is a really tough position to fill. And we ended up with a math uh, instructor that is really knocking it out of the park for us. And it was, it was literally two days before school starts and we got her. And she's been phenomenal. And it's just reinforced within the entire school that it's better to wait until you get that right match. And, and, and in the whole interviewing process, you know, you ask them all, all the questions to make sure that they're sound and they're going to be a good instructor. But it comes down to, for our, at least for our school, you have to have the right match within the, de the department. They have to have the right mindset. And if they don't have that, then we're going to pass. We'll wait. So you use the interviews to decide the match, or, or what kind of information do you look at when you, when you decide that match, oh, whether there's a good match or not? Um, well, a lot of it is just the interaction during the interview. We always have our teachers uh, do a lesson in front of the students, so we get student feedback as well. Um, I have some really quirky questions that ask because you, you know, a lot of candidates will prepare for your standard questions. So I ask, ask them some questions that are really catch them off guard, but I get at what's inside. Well, you know, here, I'll give you one of them. <laughs> <laughs> if you could be any real animal, what would you be and why? And that gets, it catches most people off guard, and you get an idea, you get a glimpse into, into that person and is that mindset going to fit with the mindset of the school? Yeah, I, would, I would echo a lot of that. So we look specifically around instructional practices by having all of our teachers do, our teacher candidates do sample lessons. Um, we also do a lot around mindsets, and particularly for our model, around equity, around understanding bias, understanding racism, oppression, and very early in our interview process have questions that we seek to sort of get underneath that so that we expect that our teachers are coming in with some baseline approach to that and have the strong instructional practices to bring into the classroom. We include students on the interviews as well. So we have uh, teachers and then um, sometimes parents, if we can get them in, and then um, students. And, and we ask a series of questions around equity and collaboration and teamwork. And we are really looking for someone who has multiple interests, so um, who is curious, who, you know, I think there, it's going to be a different set of skills. We have done the lesson, and I can't, I haven't sat on a hiring in a little bit. Um, 
but I'm not sure we have done that again because the classroom instruction is one piece of the whole p um, pie at teaching at Avalon, but another one is how do you find resource, how do you collaborate, how do you, you know, and high, high expectations is definitely a part of it. But working with kids with disabilities, what is your experience with students with disabilities? That, that has to be a part of it as well. Um, I think a brand new teacher does struggle at Avalon, so there's lots of um, support and mentorship that we do a lot. Um, but even sometimes somebody with some um, passion for why they want to be at Avalon, that, that's going to hold a lot of weight for us. So. so one of the things that I recently found out in Minnesota is that when teachers apply for a position, this is especially true in Minneapolis public schools, um, the, there are teacher evaluations which go on from previous schools, there are internal evaluations. Um, and do you get to see that when teachers apply to your school? Do you have that information about teachers' past performance? And does that enter your decision making? We do, we do not. Uh, we have to, I mean, that's, we've got trying to get better, get better at asking better questions when references because, um, because you, I mean, you'd want to know those things, but we don't have any access to their previous performance. The, the one thing I would do is um, to follow up to kind of get at that because we don't get a lot, any of that in information is when we're checking the, the, resource, the sources and their references. Um, I tend to send out an email. I don't like to do a phone call, call. I send out an email. I get a quicker response. Plus then I have a documented and there's, you know, I have a number of questions that I ask that kind that get at some of that, but but you have to really watch the data privacy issue. So that, and that's, that's a big one because a lot of people are very hesitant to say anything that might be, you know, mis misunderstood or misrepresented. So it's kind of learning about teachers as they are on their job. Um, so one question I had for you, Carrie, is um, so you have a, you know, teachers make decisions collectively. I guess including firing one of them. Yeah. So how does that work? <laughs> it's not the best. It's a little survivor-ish. Um, <laughs> but it's a very long process. But the very end of it feels a little like we just voted someone off the island. This is horrible. Um, but it, there's, it is one of the assets of Avalon is that we have incredible longevity. And when you invest in people and you invest that time, and then you know they're gonna be there to implement a strategic plan or implement those multi-age advisories and those relationships, like we don't wanna let anybody go. So um, you start with a lot of mentorship. You try to identify the problem. You, you do interventions along the way. So it's a very long process. And sometimes we have had like egregious things that have happened or even, you know, just, you're just not, you can't multitask in the way that we need you to multitask or you, you, in this model it doesn't work. Maybe you're a great teacher in a different model. Um, and we've had to let a few people go over the years, not a lot. Um, and it, it is, personnel deals with it in a very private way and they do lots of interventions, lots of steps, and then it does end up like a final decision to, with this, to the teaching staff. And it's uncomfortable. But, but we also know we're so small, we can't have a weak link, you know? And, and you're so vulnerable as a charter school or a district that if somebody is, is not doing well, you don't wanna jeopardize the whole thing because you're trying to support this one person. I would say every single person we've let go is a very nice person. <laughs> you know, there's not one person where you're like, well, that was a jerk. Uh, you just like, you're a very nice person and you're still not cutting it. So going back to the question of sort of hiring and firing of teachers, especially sort of letting go. So charter schools are sort of more flexible uh, in their ability to take those decisions, but traditional public schools typically don't have that flexibility. So, or, or do they? It, it, so my question to you is, how do you see the differences in that autonomy um, for leaders in a traditional public school district compared to what, what charter school principals or, or organizational leaders would have? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there are some similarities in that we're trying to, um, we're hiring the best quality teachers that we can find, right? We want to, um, and be very proactive about it in their development. A lot of the things that 
um, these charter principals and representatives have said, um, I think echoes in St. Paul as well. Uh, some of the things that we've done to try to find um, really high quality teachers that would be the best fit in St. Paul is uh, start early, start that recruiting process early. You know, it's too, wait, it's too late to wait until July or August. We, we have front loaded even our budget process so that we kind of have an idea of who we need and when so that we can get out there as soon as possible. We also have partnerships with programs. An example would be our Suter program, which is the Urban Teacher Residency Program, where we're trying to uh, get teachers in, uh, particularly teachers of color, uh, get them in who have education backgrounds and provide them mentoring opportunities, uh, offer them more you know, professional development and, and, in this program so that they can really uh, become great, even better teachers, right? And have that um, mentorship and support that they need in those first few years. Um, but the bottom line is we have, there's three years when teachers come into St. Paul and they're high quality teachers. We need to take them from good to even better. And they've got, we've got three years to do that and find that right fit. And if it doesn't happen, then we need to you know, have hard conversations and make hard decisions about tenure and moving forward. And when people come on board with St. Paul, they, you know, it's a large urban district. And you have to, you know, much like the charter schools, you need to know what you're getting into and be excited about that and the opportunities that that can bring. And if it's not a good fit, that might be okay, you know, it might be better for you and the students and the, and the school. And so we kind of have three years to figure that out. But in that three year process, I do think it's, you know, it's our job to make sure that we're supporting those teachers and helping them to grow and develop. And we do that through evaluations, um, observations in the classroom, mentorship opportunities, professional development, you know, a lot of what, what um, my colleagues here have already talked about. Uh, but, but within that three year period, there is flexibility. Uh, if it's if it's not a good fit, if it doesn't seem to be working out, and to have those honest conversations. So, so you did mention that you know you're, you're trying to get the best teachers possible, but there's also this aspect, which just also came up in the morning today, is that there is a sorting of teachers across different schools. So th you tend to see that sort of better performing s teachers uh, sort them and move to better performing schools. So you have teachers who are maybe less experienced and have sort of a you know. Uh, relatively lower performing in low performing schools and the students probably uh, this is an empirical question but would probably be um, you could use some sort of reshuffling of teachers of actually having some of them go to these low performing schools so are there any mechanisms or are there any programs where you incentivize these teachers to actually stay in low performing school when they start there rather than moving on and moving to better performing schools so I actually do not know if what is the incentives um, and how those programs work. A lot of that is determined through our uh, bargaining and union and um, other conversations. Uh, but I do know that any teacher that would come in, uh, like I had said, would you know needs to have those supports in place and to become a great teacher. And whether that's pairing them with a more experienced teacher, so they have. Um, that support that they need. Uh, but as far as the, the policies in place, as far as teacher assignment, that's not, don't work on that. But I can certainly get back to you. That's good. <laughs> so moving on to sort of the other issue that uh, has come up today is the whole changing accountability system at the federal level, which has sort of uh, triggered off changes at the state level as well as different school district levels. Um, so maybe I'll start with you uh, about sort of the bigger picture. Um, so one of the changes that has happened is changes in how we measure student performance. And that has changed over time. So No Child Left Behind was one metric. It was just prof proficiency and performance at the school level. And then there was a sort of the recognition that that's not the best thing we can do. There are other aspects of um, you know, measuring student performance. So it sort of got expanded. And here in Minnesota, we included not our levels. We included growth. We included things like graduation rates and attendance. So all that was sort of one metric. Uh, we create an index, and we sort of classify schools. Now we move to a system where we have five different characteristics. And there's sort of a more complicated way of trying and assigning uh, you know, looking at all these different dimensions. So just a question about how has these measurements changed and do you think they're going to change the way we measure school performance? 
and identify students that are struggling. So I think there's a couple pieces to that. At the end of the day, we still have to largely use assessments and test scores, and that's outlined in federal law, that we have to do that in the accountability, in the accountability system has to do that. Um, and so because of that is, that's the base, I think as far as it being very drastically different, I don't, I don't know that it, it will be at the end of the day in that aspect. Now there's some key differences, and I think Commissioner Casillas talked about those this morning. One of them being for the first time we are starting, we're using the ACCESS test, which is our English language learner test. So we're, we're elevating that um, English language proficiency, and we're, we're treating it the same as math and reading. So getting our English language learners on track to English proficiency is, has been elevated. Now it has a lot more weight in this system, in this accountability system. Uh, the other thing I would say that's different is in an attempt to find data around this, this concept that Commissioner Casillas has talked about this morning of well-rounded education, um, the department and a lot of stakeholders, some of which are in this room, had a lot of conversations around well-rounded education and what does that mean and what can we use to measure that so we're not just using math and reading or academic test scores. Uh, and what we settled on was this idea of consistent attendance. Uh, the reason being because there wasn't, um, the just, there wasn't a, a whole lot of data to, um, to pull from in the short term that was across all of our schools and all of our students. But I think that's a short term solution and I do think that there is a desire and an, an intention to find something that could better capture this idea of well-rounded and bring something else into the mix. And I think that would be helpful uh, for schools and also for parents and communities to have some other kind of data that's informing the discussion around uh, accountability and, and school identification. Because I heard a lot this morning about high, high quality and good schools and making good choices uh, when a lot of that, I think, from kind of what I'm gathering, is based on test scores and assessments. And I think we know that that's not, that's not always the best way to do that, and it's not a lot of times what parents even value the most. I don't think, nor would I advise any parent to go out to the Department of Education website, pull up the proficiency percentages for all the schools, rank order them, and the one that shows up on top say, yep, that's the one my students go, my kiddo's going to. I mean, I think there's other factors, these programs that we're talking about, ways they're innovating that are uh, better options, and, and people are willing to make trade-offs. Or even how is my child gonna feel when they go to that school? Are they gonna feel like they belong? Are they gonna have friends and peers? Are they gonna get excited every day? I can tell you that you know, it might be the highest performing school in the state. If my, if my kid isn't excited about going there every day and isn't excited about learning, I, I'm willing to, to take a lower ranking on an accountability system to make sure that he finds a place where he really feels like he belongs, so. I think that's an important question. How do parents make choices? So in your experience as, you know, in interacting with parents, parents who are trying to figure out whether they should come to your charter schools or not, what, what sense do you get? What are parents looking for? I would say I, I sort of agree about the proficiency, but I d also disagree, right? And I, I say that both as the conversations I've had with parents in our network and myself as a parent who just moved here, particularly because I think what happens right now, what I saw is sort of this masking of proficiency in averages, and particularly as a charter network that serves students of color, families of color, families from low-income backgrounds, is this masking of huge disparities when we, when we say proficiency. Um, and so I don't think that's the only driver, but I think it's a really powerful leverage point for parents to be able to say, I expect that my child will achieve at the same levels as any other student in this school. Um, and that's something that was, for me, again, like moving here, looking at, oh, sort of on average, schools sort of look like they're doing okay. And then you start to disaggregate data, again, by race, ethnicity, by low-income background, and see 20, 30, 40, some schools that were sort of marketed to me as a really great place for my kid with a 40 point disparity between outcomes for white students and students of color. Um, and so that to me is why I think we can't fully move away from proficiency. I agree, I love that access is part of what we're looking at now for our English language learners. I think looking at growth really matters. The reason attendance matters around chronic, not just what's your average attendance rate, but actually looking at chronic absenteeism is an important way of looking at attendance. Um, and then I think there are those pieces that I agree with around parents making choices around the sort of model or program. 
right? The fit, the way in which this supports my child and who they are and what I want for them. Um, and then I think there also just is a place right now where uh, in our, in my understanding of this market, there's like some saturation of the default option sort of being okay to start with. So this might be unique to us in South Minneapolis, but we're finding uh, not a huge wait list and not any wait list and actually room in our schools in kindergarten and first grade and then a little bit more sort of desire in third grade and fourth grade. And by the time we get to our middle schools and sixth grade are seeing a lot more parents sort of seeking out other options. And I'm wondering, I don't have a, a fully sort of thought out answer yet, but one of the things I'm wondering as we're thinking about our school and enrollment is why is that? What is it about sort of the initial, whether it's a neighborhood school or sort of district default options that are sort of feel okay at first and over time sort of no, no longer meeting the needs of kids? Um, particularly students of color and students from low-income backgrounds. And so that's something I'm thinking about parents and the way in which they're making choices. Um, what is it about our current landscape that's driving some of that? Yeah, since we serve 6 through 12 also, so parents have already been in, a lot of them have been in a traditional system. Some had homeschooled, some had um, been to other charters. But it is... I think what they're searching for is a place where their child is validated. So we do have extremes. We have some highly, highly gifted kids who are just, you know, off the charts. And then we have the kids who have been so depressed and can't even get out of bed. And they, they can have a very high IQ. And, and they're just looking for somewhere where their kid feels happy. We do have a very high um, transgender population, and we were one of the first um, to – to really um, do some stuff around bathrooms. And so I have other charter leaders calling me about that, like what was the process on that? And we have transgender bathrooms and really making it inclusive to the LGBT community. Um, we have a lot of work to do in racial equity and that's something that we've been working on because of our demographics. We're so predominantly white that we're, pro we're not doing enough that a person of color walks in and says, yeah, I feel welcome here or something because we don't reflect St. Paul Public Schools, so we know where we need to work on. Um, we d we have one EL student in St. Paul, and we're located in St. Paul, and that that just doesn't match either. <laughs> so that we know there are gaps, and um, and what I do know is parents are kind of at their wits' end, and they haven't had a place where their child was happy or validated, and um, and so I'd say that's the biggest reason people choose Avalon. Um, and I chose Minneapolis Public Schools for my kids, and I chose Edison High School, which is very close to here, because of the racial diversity. Like, what can I not offer my own child? Like, I grew up in the suburbs of Minnesota, a very predominantly white experience, and I want him to have a different experience. I want my daughter to have a different experience. So I think we all make different choices. I wasn't going to look at the, <laughs> the, the website to look at Edison's proficiency scores because that wasn't the value. I wanted him to have an integrated experience with kids from all around the world speaking all sorts of languages, and he's getting that, and it's wonderful. So I don't know. As, as far as parents, when they come in to uh, visit our school, most of them are looking for a small school. A small, our class sizes, our average is about 17 to 1. Uh, we do not have any classes over 25. So the teacher student relationship is there. And the other, the other, I guess, selling point of the school is if there's ever an, an issue for the student, they can set up an appointment with their teacher pretty much any time of the day and email, call them up, and get the help they need within reason. All of our, all of our teachers post office hours, um, and I've told them, you have to keep the weekends open for yourself and your family. You've got to have a little balance. But uh, a lot of it is the teachers are there for the students. We have extremely high, high bars for our students, but we put in the supports to make sure they get there. And then, th then the other part of that is if the students stay in our school system, by the time they're a senior, 70% of our seniors are full-time PSEO students. So they're not even on campus, they're in college. 25% uh, of our juniors are already at PSEO. And then we, all, we, all, we have a slew of uh, AP courses, and most of those students have already completed all the AP courses. So a lot of our senior graduates already have a two-year degree. So the the focus is really on the academics. So they are really looking at that. Interesting. So one of the things you mentioned.
mentioned in the beginning was that you, when we started your school, it was predominantly white, but over time, the composition has changed, and now you have about over 20% uh, Asians, and uh, you have about 10% blacks. So I was wondering how much of it was, uh, you know, one Asian kid came, enjoyed the experience, or really thought that this is the best fit, but then you have all these other parents sending their kids off that demographic group to your school. So is it you know, information through the network that it's a good experience school, or is it something about the curriculum or the focus of your school that's driving parents, especially of this demographic, to send them to your school? I think it's a combination of things. Uh, the students that are there, we expanded when we first started we had one activity and that was band and that was it and our and and the band director is still there and he's kind of a little miffed because we've got over 50 activities now and so we don't lose a lot of students like we were before because we didn't have the activity uh, so there's all kinds of activities uh, our number one activity this year is the Africa Club and it's open to all students, and we have over 55 students in that club alone. So we, a lot of the activities are student-driven. If there's a need, we'll, we'll find an advisor, we'll make the activity work. So a lot of that is the word of mouth from the students to other students, hey, this is a cool school, come. Um, the hardest part is getting in, because there's really only two years you can get into the school, and that's either sixth grade during the lottery, or between eighth and ninth grade because we have about 25 to 30 students that want to leave the school for the big school feel or we don't offer football, hockey, lacrosse. So they want to go and experience that. So the freshman coming in freshman year is the other opportunity. The problem with that is the math requirement. And if they haven't stayed up with their academics, they really struggle. We have about a 50% success rate with the incoming freshmen staying and graduating just because of the academic rigor. They're not used to it. And a lot of them transfer out and, and you know before they even get to their junior year. And that's one area that we're trying to figure out what's the best way to fill that gap so we don't lose those students. That if you come, you're gonna stay. And and we have a solution. We'll see how long. See it, if it takes. It's about a four-year fix. So we'll see. And on that note, I would like to open the audience to ask questions that they may have for our panelists. Um, I'm curious with the teacher-led school models, how scalable you think that is, or if you think that there's like a middle ground version that would be scalable. Like I'm curious, do you have to go 100% of the way in, or do you think large districts could start adopting uh, versions of that? Oh yeah, definitely, that large districts can adopt versions of it. And so Avalon is probably more on the extreme of a language called teacher-powered schools. So there is a teacher-powered school network, and most of them, or I don't know what the chunk of it is, but a lot of them have principals. So as there's works at Avalon that we can divide up the administrative duties because we have people who've been there a long time. You would need a, a principal, I mean, in a, in a tradition, even in a teacher-empowered school. So um, because of just all the work that needs to happen. So you, it's, not a, it's not a system where there's no leadership and it's not a system um, that needs to be collective consensus like Avalon that is, that is on the continuum of way over here. And then there is a whole bunch of other ways. But I think empowering teachers, I have worked there for 18 years you wouldn't have told me, if you told me 18 years ago I'd still be there, that it would be a shock. But the reason I've stayed and the reason so many people stay is, is that I have a lot of autonomy, I have a lot of collegial su support, I get to know the kids, I, it's, it's a very engaging job, and then you get to learn skills along the way. We've moved our facilities, I've been on personnel, I've learned about human resources, I've learned, and so my career, even though I'm located in one spot, has grown all those years. And I don't have to leave teaching to do it. And I think that's, that's the other problem is yet you do have people who leave 
because if you're doing the same thing, it's a hard career to do for 30 years. So you need to have some variety. You need to have some ownership. You need to have some way to make it fresh. <laughs> Uh, I, this, this has been a, a really rich discussion um, about accountability and measuring school and teacher quality. Um, and I agree with, both as a parent and an advocate, I agree with the premise that um, uh, it's complicated, um, that diversity matters, that SEL matters, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I, I feel like these discussions sometimes sort of tail off into the conclusion that it's just too difficult to measure. Um, whether you're talking about school quality or teacher quality. And, um, it, and it certainly is too difficult to kind of boil it down into a single summative score that is, I think, useful to parents, um, especially at school level for comparison shopping. Um, and so I, I, I guess my, my question is, what do you all think about that? And if you were to construct a metric um, to measure maybe school quality or teacher quality, what would be the metrics that would kind of go into that? I mean, first of all, do you think it's possible? Um, and second of all, how would you construct it if you were in charge? So, I mean, we could have like an hours long conversation about this. Uh, so most recently, before I joined Hiawatha Academies, I worked in St. Louis Public Schools in Missouri. Uh, and a big part of my job in the academic office was to think about creating a performance management system for schools. And both from a standpoint of how do you help a large urban district really get a clear sense of where to leverage resources, where to think about support, how to make decisions about maybe moving teachers, if that's something we could get, you know, can make happen. Um, and to answer your question, like there isn't, I think, a perfect solution. My opinion is like it's fidelity to what you decide. Right, so it is actually saying, this is either the school saying, these are the five metrics that matter most to us, given our model, given the things that we believe in, hold us accountable to that, and let us go do those things really well. Or I think, like you could do it at five schools, I think you can do it in a district, if you get really clear on what those things are, and then stick with it. The challenge that I've seen is that the, as sort of the wind blows, or as sort of things don't maybe look as good as you think they look, things start to shift, and it's, Again, I think one of the big things around attendance, right, was like, let's just look at average daily attendance. And it's like, oh, actually, that's not quite good enough. Let's actually look at absenteeism rates, and then let's set some thresholds around that, right? And like, things have shifted, which means any sort of systems that maybe were built before aren't now capturing sort of the best information. Um, so again, I think, I think you can build it, because I spent a lot of time, and I, I think there's some, some movement happening there. And I think more than any decision about what those metrics are is how do you stick with it? How do you actually implement it? How do you tie it to the things the school themselves and, and at least in the charter world are trying to make progress on? And that's what I want in a real accountability system. And if I don't make progress on that, if our network isn't making progress on those things, then support, then actual accountability. Um, because that's, that's to me this question earlier, like policy doesn't really shift it at some point it also has to be the intrinsic, the cultural, the people who are saying we have to hold ourselves accountable to this. We can talk a lot longer if you want to talk after this. Um, so part of how we're evaluated as a charter school is there is the biggest chunk is our test score. So that's one big chunk. But then there are many, many variables. And if I think of a very, very low performing mm -hmm. charter school, is they're not hitting many of the variables. So. So unless, um, so, so we are evaluated on our financial management, we're evaluated on our governance, we're about, you know, school culture and climate. Um, I think interviews and surveys and ask the kids, the kids know, know who's a good teacher or not. The kids know, like, so surveying people, getting a sense of school climate in a meaningful way, but looking at the full picture, is it a well-run organization? I mean, um, because unhappiness in teachers is going to also impact your your school. So if you know Minneapolis teachers are unhappy, that's going to impact my children. If it so, I think you can definitely do, but you need to have a broad base. And um, and when I say I wasn't worried about proficiency for my children, that's because I come with a ton of privilege, and I know I'm there, and I know like. 
but I wanted so, like I'm not going to worry about the test scores because they are already fine. It, but I wouldn't risk that if if I was from a different community. So, and I, we do need that information to look at the disparity in Minnesota. We'll never address it if we don't look at it. It's just I think it burns teachers out to to deal with some of the intractable problems that are so st systemic, and we get we get held accountable for all the, <laughs> the societal problems. You know, so I think you have to do multiple measures. What can you control? How can you make look at this face that's in front of you and make a difference in their lives? I think that's where we get burned out as teachers or educators, where you're just like, well, <laughs> you know, it's like body mass index. You know, that's a great measure for like look at nationwide obesity, but it's not a great measure if you just like look at that individual body. Everybody's different, and it doesn't work. You know, you could have a bodybuilder over there, and they would have a very high BMI. <laughs> you know, I don't know. So like, just being honest about the whole picture and not making us make these really simplistic political statements about what's right and wrong. Just to chime in on that, the, you know, test scores for our school are, are fantastic. I'm not gonna lie about that. But, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, bring them on, we want them, right? No, no but that's not the only, that, that should not be the only metric that parents look at and I have a, a number of friends that are in a charter world, and one of them happens to work at Paladine. And, and that charter school takes students that are going into the traditional trades area, so they're never going to score fantastic on ECT scores. They're not, they're, he's taking, you know, the students that come to that charter school are so disadvantaged, but they're focused at the mission of the school. So you really have to look at the schools almost on an individual basis. If What is their mission? You know, and evaluate the school on their mission. Our mission uh, at our school is to prepare our students to go on and be, you know, become doctors and lawyers and engineers. If we're not doing that, the parents, that's what they expect from our school. If, if we have students that are coming to be mechanics and plumbers and electricians, our school is not set up to do that. So if, you, if that's a metric you're going to use to evaluate us, we're going to do extremely poor because that's not our mission. So you really kind of have to look at what is the school's mission, what are they trying to accomplish, and evaluate the school on those metrics, which unfortunately, you know, given the gamut of all the different schools in the state and in the country, is extremely hard to do. It's nice to have you know, some benchmarks standardized tests to kind of compare. However, that should not be the driving force because there's too many schools that it doesn't fit. I would like to add to that and say in St. Paul currently, we're going through a strategic planning process right now where we're outlining um, some core outcomes that we would like, there's five outcomes that we're uh, going to be aligning all of our initiatives and programs too and how does the work that we're doing line up to those you know five really high level outcomes that we want for all of our students and I would say that within that discussion we really have to and what other folks have said here at the at the table is that we have to focus on what those core what is our core mission what is our core function um, what does that look like how does that align with the outcomes that we want to see but then also within that like with these others, there's a lot of variety within the district. So how do we take that core, this is what we want for all of our students and this is what we want them to be getting, but how can we do that in a way uh, that's creative, that's project-based, or that, look, that fits in with a Montessori model, or it's with an arts and theater kind of focus? I think it doesn't have to be either or. You can have this core of what foundation of what you want all of your students to have, but then look for creative and innovative ways to make that happen. And so I think, um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing too, I think, is in how you're messaging that accountability, right? And I think for a long time, it's been very punitive. You get this label, you're bad, you know, and no one wants to be your friend <laughs> and, and talk to you. And now I think, or I hope, what I'm hearing is that it's shining a light on okay, where, where, are, where do we have disparities? And what do we do to address that? Where does that mean that you need more support to do the work? 
What's lacking that you need to make sure that all of our students are achieving? You know, what do, what do, what do you need? What are we not giving you? Um, we're hearing that more from the state, and the state accountability is more supportive, not, you know, you're, you're bad, you're not doing a good job to, you know, something clearly, something clearly needs to support you to be able to do even better so that all of our students can, can get to that high expectation of learning and development. And I think teacher quality is a huge piece. Like you, we've, uh, hopefully, if you've been in a class, you've seen really good teaching, and then you've also seen really poor teaching that you wouldn't want to subject your children to. So I think these are real things that we need to talk about, and they do impact every single kid. And, and I know the charter school purpose is really to try innovative things and to, we have great relationships with many districts, and they come through and they take pieces of, teacher empowerment or project-based learning and this is that's what I love is like sharing resources and I think when you ask families to take a risk with their own child like we have to be wary of that too like yeah we want risk that's great if your company fails but it, it's not great if your students fail 